friends, I'm Ashish Tabari, founder and CEO of Fraximize. And to our new listeners, welcome. To our old ones, welcome back. In the previous podcast, we discussed briefly two very important topics with formal. One was the topic of constraints and the other one was coverage. Now, some of you may have noted the connection between these two. Today, we will dive a bit more deep into this topic, and especially the combination of constraints and coverage. Now, in order to connect these two worlds better, let us introduce two important concepts. So one is controllability and the other is observability. Controllability is the ability to control or regulate stimulus and in effect, control or regulate the ability to wake up or activate certain design states. Observability, on the other hand, defines what behavior is possible to observe in response to what has been controlled or activated. So the beauty of formal verification is that we can reason about these two concepts in a natural way. So if we end up blocking too much input stimulus, we end up having too tight a control in effect, blocking the ability to even wake up or activate certain design code. Now, this will most naturally result in a lot of consequential design code to be not observed. Now, notice how so far we have talked about control and observation with respect to the design code. But one should note that in formal, the observation itself is performed by checkers, that is, assertions and covers. So, What we are really saying is that poor control leads to poor observability, causing less design code to be activated, less design code to be observed, and in effect, cause less design code to be checked. And what does that lead to? Missed bugs. Now, what is most interesting about this interplay of control and observation, causing a direct effect on checkers and covers, is that structural and functional coverage gets blended into one uniform view. This never happens with simulation-based verification. In simulation, one normally goes about collecting code coverage or structural coverage separately. And usually the exercise of collecting functional coverage is done separate, requiring a functional coverage specification. Whereas bad structural coverage results in poor functional coverage, obviously, it's an obvious artifact in simulation as well, the analysis of both these coverage mechanisms is not done in a continuous, homogeneous manner. In most cases, simulation verification focuses on understanding the effect of drivers and sequencers with the scoreboard and checkers. In formal verification, since we do not write any input sequences and rely on the formal tools to blast in all possible stimulus, we focus directly on the checkers and covers. The same two entities which do the checking also provide insights into what is covered. In some ways, we are really able to perform reflection. Now, the million-dollar question, of course, is, so what does formal coverage look like? Now, there has been a lot of baggage of simulation-based verification in formal that you would expect because simulation has been in use for much longer than formal verification, especially in hardware verification. So traditionally, most EDA vendors thought, if you're going to sell formal verification to simulation guys, let's just speak the same language. And so code coverage became the de facto starting point for formal. I recall about 11, 12 years ago, nobody in formal would even talk about coverage. Everyone simply asked, did it fail? Did it pass? Or was it inconclusive? And the last outcome in particular was very interesting. When formal proofs didn't converge, managers wanted to understand why they should trust formal and was all that money worth spent. And this is where cone of influence and proof core coverage was born. Suddenly, someone thought, hey, we can go back to the management and tell them about how much of the design was reached during a bounded proof, and this could then be used to sign off the verification of that block against the inconclusive proof, right? 
well, no, wrong. Sadly, it isn't as simple as that. Just because a certain portion of the design was activated during the proof run doesn't mean we observed the entire total consequential behavior that was required to be observed through a conclusive proof of an assertion. Now, even if the proof was conclusive, one needs to determine if you didn't have bad control, that is, bad constraints. Situation with bounded proofs, however, and signing off against bounded proofs, against those bound numbers, is not a perfect science. I know some people like to call it a perfect science. In a very restricted type of designs, where specific type of proof engines were used, one can carefully determine that it may be acceptable to stop wasting more proof cycles and move on to the next stage. But note that I wouldn't still use the word sign off. In most cases, proof code and cone of influence based analysis is misleading. If a particular formal tool vendor A uses an abstract proof engine, it would report a pessimistic core of the design being covered. Naturally, as a consequence of the proof engine being abstract, it would focus on less microarchitecture design states. Now, another tool on the same design for the same property may provide a more optimistic report as they may decide to use a different proof strategy. So how on earth would you reconcile these metrics? The problem gets compounded with cone of influence in the mix as well. Almost every decent formal tool that I know of uses cone of influence as the very first reduction strategy. In fact, if you want to know what is cone of influence reduction, I recommend reading Ed Clark's classic book on model checking. You know, it assumes similarity with formal logic notations, which a lot of engineers may find hard, but the basic concept of cone of influence has been talked about in great detail in that book. If you're still not convinced that proof core and COI coverage is not very useful and that signing off with boundary proofs is okay, let me talk to you about an example. Okay, so this is an extremely simple example of a MUX based control in your design where the if branch of the MUX is controlled through a deep counter, let's say a 32 bit counter tracking the state of some buffer somewhere else in the design. Let's say the buffer has a bug that only shows up when it has reached three quarters full. So in practice, this buggy design in the field may exhibit this buggy scenario, but with formal or with simulation pushing the boundaries to force the counter to go three quarters full of two to the power 32 possible values is not going to be tractable. So let's say we have an assertion that is meant to check both the if and the else part of the MUX. And with the bounded proof, you know, that's the best we've got for this assertion. So now with the bounded proof, if we ask the formal tool, it would happily report that both the if part of the MUX was covered and the else part. Now, the if part of the MUX was covered from a proof core and cone of influence point of view, so you can generate that information. But if your proof bound, was any less than three quarters of two to the power 32, then it means we have not reached the buggy state in formal. So the bug won't be found. And if you now decide to sign off against whatever bound you got, which is less than 3.22 billion, then you're likely to miss that bug. So I'm suggesting you just write an assertion. So look, I'm not sorry, I'm not suggesting you write an assertion and let the tool go on counting ad infinitum. And for counter-based designs, there are techniques we can use to catch this bug. But the point I'm making here is that counters, FIFOs, and other deep state-holding elements that control the entire mesh of the design can cause tremendous problems with proof convergence, which can cause boundary proofs. And then it will not be easy to simply discover the relationship between these different components as spread all across the design. And even if you were able to establish those relationships, and end up having a very simple maths-based scenario like I just talked about this if-then-else max, you still have to know a lot more about which proof engines, whether they were abstract or not, which cone of influence is structural or functional was affecting the outcome, and in which formal tool. So you can't actually compare apples with apples because you just don't have two apples coming out of the two different formal tools. So now if you're with me on this topic, you must be wondering how the heck do we sign off our formal verification test benches? Well, sadly, there is no magic bullet. 
The common sense approach, of course, is to break your design, introduce artificial bugs, and check whether your proof outcomes on asserts and covers changes. This approach is not that much different in the most traditional form of verification, going back to the age-old testing-based verification where people would write good test and bad test, right? So we are actually trying to now reproduce the same concept in, a, in the sense of coverage, where we're saying, let's break the design and see what happens, whether the outcomes on the uh, proof outcomes on assertions and covers change. So in our training courses, of course, we go in a lot of depth with the whole recipe of how you sign off with Formal, which I'm unable to do in a podcast today. Um, but you know what? You have a chance to come and, and get um, diving deep into this. Uh, we are running a course in June and July, and you can go ahead and sign up for that on mentor.com slash training. Uh, as you see, you may already know, Axomize has partnered with Mentor Graphics to provide the Axomize formal verification methodology training. So on that note, I hope you will get a chance to reflect on today's topic. Do let us know what you think. Uh, email us at info at axomize.com and follow us on our YouTube channel and let's stay connected. And see you next week.